Welcome back to The Morning Show here on Arise News. Here to discuss her exclusive interview with Reni Folario, the founder of Africa's leading luxury retail store, is Oji Okpe. Hello, Oji. Good morning, Tindu. Good morning, Dr. Bati. Hello, Hello Leila. Oji. Good morning, Oji. Welcome to The Morning it's Show. It's our first time on the show yeah. together. <laughs> <laughs> nice Thank to have you. you here. Thank you. All right. Well, Reni Folario has been in the forefront of establishing a global language for Africans in terms of luxury. And I wanted to find out how sustainable her idea of luxury is in Africa, especially in a country like Nigeria, where we really don't have a middle class, let alone the percentage of people that can truly afford luxury to support her goal. Reni told me quite a bit about how sustainable her idea is and how we should all start seeing Africa as the new hub that can gravitate global luxury through innovation. Let's take a look. She is a Nigerian businesswoman breaking boundaries in the retail world in Africa. Redefining luxury living and fashion for Nigerians, Reni Folawio created a masterpiece combining contemporary African design, fashion, and art. With the help of renowned British Ghanaian architect David Ajaye, the store popularly known as Alara in the heart of Lagos was designed with state-of-the-art dimensions that can be identified for its authentic African infusion of cultural aesthetics, making the building one of Africa's most recognizable beacon in architectural design. After I met David, I understood that he literally understood exactly what we wanted to do with Alara. And that connection of understanding where we were going was very unusual because I had spoken to other architects who literally would have done something but didn't have a deep understanding of what we wanted to do with Alara and also the understanding about the timing of what we were doing with Alara. Understanding that that moment, that moment that we decided to do this was such an important for the black world in general. Reni Folawio was born in London and raised in Western Nigeria. She initially studied law and worked in her father's law firm for 10 years before she found her love for art. After dabbling into fashion design, she opened an interior design business producing custom furniture. I looked around and I realized that people were not creating um, like joinery and doors that were of certain quality and they needed the same machines. So I thought, oh, I'll become somebody that makes doors. And then we can have the luxury of creating beautiful products, using the machines to refine them um, to, to cut and everything, and then using our hands to refine them. So I had two things going on. I had the factory creating the doors and the joinery, like everything you, you see here that wouldn't be done in my factory. And then we'll have the studio to create the more creative, the more indulgent pieces. Over the years, Rennie had been a keen observer of the various dyeing trades within the continent and wanted to create a dialogue to connect Western luxury with contemporary African designs culture and identity. In doing so, Alara became that synergy where people from different works of life could go to experience a luxury lifestyle and African cuisine in the annex of her signature store, Knock by Alara. Apart from the fact that we wanted to celebrate African cuisine, we also wanted an entry point into our vision, a point where people can come in and taste and understand what we're trying to do with the space. First of all, we started the restaurant itself, and then we thought, okay, there's so many people, so many young people that we can be um, attracting that cannot afford to be in this space. So we created the garden, which is super relaxed, super young, and very approachable with simple foods. So what we have now in Alara is that we have a combination of everyone. We have young people, we have people who are wealthier, we have everybody who, are, who we hope can come into the space and enjoy part of our vision and be inspired by it. With the combination of luxury and fine dining, Reni Folawio's artistry has provided a global luxury hub to attract the world's finest consumers. Reni is not only a lover of the arts, she is also a voice for female entrepreneurs and women empowerment. Women are put in a position where they doubt their power or they haven't been able to engage enough to understand how, what their power is and how they can use it. And for me, power is not about being the top of a corporation. You have your power because you're able to impact people.
people around you. With several initiatives under her belt to redefine the continent, I was curious to discover more about her quest to promote African design and to change the industry's status quo. Reni Folawio, welcome to the program. Thank you for joining me today. Thank you for having me. It's a great pleasure. All right. I know that you have said that the aim for Alara is to establish a contemporary visual language for African luxury. Yes. I know how important that is. Why do you think it's taken Nigerians this long to have outfits like an Alara? I think it's belief. Belief in ourselves and understanding how excellent and beautiful that we can be and things that we make can be. And not understanding that if you are committed to excellence, you believe yourself first and you're committed to excellence, you can stand on the same platform as anybody else in the world. And I thought that by building Alara, I would show Nigerians and the world that it is possible to make beautiful things and to be on the same platform as all the greats of the world. And you do have beautiful pieces here. Very Thank expensive you. too, most of the items. A lot of it is expensive, yes. The percentage of Nigerians that I can afford luxury items is, is, is very scarce. And so how are you able to um, break into the market? I mean, to be a luxury store, you have to stock important, beautiful, the most beautiful things at a great value. And I think that they are the numbers. There's enough numbers. The thing about luxury is that's the smallest numbers of people that actually buy the most of luxury. Um, but I think we've also, we also understand that in Nigeria, we have to combine and there are different levels of luxury. I mean, we could have like the best jewelry in the world. You know what I mean? We could have all that in the store, but we don't. We have what we think is the level of luxury we think the Nigerians can afford now. We also have products for the middle market. Okay. Yes, we have, we, and we have kind of tried to cleverly mix. What, I mean, we have stuff that costs $50 in the store, believe it or not. Oh, that's Awesome to know. I, I want to pick um, that item yeah. before I leave. Yes, we have a few things. We understand that. But also, apart from that, we also realize that there are a lot of young people who want to buy into our vision okay. and who want to understand and live it. And we, we, we realize that they have to come in at a level. Um, and there can be beautifully made things which can sit in our store and be affordable. But also remember that we also have a restaurant. Yes. And, and the restaurant also, apart from the fact that we wanted to celebrate African cuisine, we also wanted an entry point into our vision. Okay. A point where people can come in and taste and understand what we're trying to do with the space. Okay, so, but I mean, that's amazing. But in terms of the store Alara itself, yeah. have you been able to break into the market? I mean, it's work in progress, but we are very positive in the sense that, like I said, we've tried to be very clever about positioning and product. Um, what we've done is that we have a mix of really high end stuff and sort of lowish stuff. So we are able to gauge what's selling at what point and we change a lot. We are very dynamic um, and we're very numbers conscious. So whatever is not working, we cut it. We try new things all the time. Whatever is giving us more profit, we have it on the floor. And remember that again, we have furniture, we have you know objects, we have an interior design service. You know, so in, 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 in terms of the space, and we also have events, we use the space. We're not like, we're not too precious about the space. We make money from events in the space. Um, so we, we are not relying on fashion. Um, fashion is difficult to rely on. Um, so we have all these like different business units that literally are side by side and we push each one as strongly as the other. But I think Alara is known more for fashion because fashion is the most glamorous. Absolutely. <laughs> and so that's where my question was. Yes, it's the most it's glamorous the um, yeah. um, part of, of what we do. But there's so much more behind the scenes that we do to keep up and, and to make sure that our numbers are working at every point in time. Very nice. So your merchandising, what, what sort of support, financial support do you have at the moment? Well, none at the moment. <laughs> um, no, 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 that's why I said we, at the end of the day, we're still using our seed money. We started with the seed money, and we have not got any support since then. And that is it's kudos to my team for being able to keep this going. Um, and when people say it's hard to have fashion, Nigerian fashion or African fashion, I, I tell them no. I, I tell them you just have to be very clever and super hardworking. Um, but I think going forward for a lot of the plans that we have, we will need support. 
and um, we have uh, a lot of proposals for, for, for support and hopefully um, um, we'll be able to get it. Um, there's a lot happening in fashion. Um, there's a lot of funds sort of coming in and we hope to be able to take advantage of that. And what are they asking for, for example, if you have to, um, you know, get whatever support that you need? What are they really looking for? They're looking for everything, the same thing that everybody looks for in any business. You have a business plan that looks like it's going to work. You have a projection that looks like it's going to work. You understand. The only problem is that fashion and investment in fashion is very new. Uh, people are not used to investing in fashion. And um, the, the, the people who are in fashion, like designers and things, are not used to having to do what it takes to get this investment. It's a lot of work. You have a business plan. You have to make sure it works. You have to, you know, there's a lot that, that goes behind to be able to get money from anyone. Um, and understanding the process is a first step. So um, understanding the process and then matching that to the funds that are available. Um, so I think fashion is just starting. A bit like the way tech was a few years ago. People are starting to look at fashion as something to invest in. And I think people in the business of fashion, the fashion designers, the retailers, need to be prepared for what it takes to be able to access those funds. So it's a two-way thing. Um, and the more developed the fashion industry gets, the more the funds will be available. Develop means you, you show that this business can actually work as a business. Um, and um, then you know you can start to get funds. Funds are not just going to come. Um, I do understand, though, that the banks and probably individuals actually instinctively don't want to invest in fashion because they think it's a little flaky. <laughs> they think it's a little flaky. And that's so unfair because, yes, I mean, I think it's, yeah, it's, it's such a huge industry yes, for you yes. to even think that. And it has huge potential. Huge potential. Yeah, yes. it's also getting people out of their box. I mean, the bankers know what works for them. That's been working for them for many years. They, you don't want necessarily find the most creative people in banking. You understand? And that's a shame. And then the sort of investment climate in Nigeria is not that developed. People are not used to investing in people so, or investing in ideas that are new and fresh and that can change the world. They want to invest in the same things they've been investing in so that they can have the same percentage that they've been, they've been getting. So I'm not sure whether it's in the banking industry that we're going to, that's, that's going to help the, the fashion industry or it's venture capitalism. But there's like, it could be, there are different ways that you can raise money. Um, and if the banking industry is not going to be supportive, there are other avenues now that we can look at um, for, for people to invest in, 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 in fashion. But the reason why we're in a good place is that we started off, we can show that it works, yes. and we can show that it could work even better going into the future. And I think um, in that way, we can start to seduce investors to looking at fashion. You were a panelist at the just concluded Arise Fashion Week. What was the most important thing that you got out of that event? I think um, it was Barbara James that mentioned the importance of creating a fund. Um, I think um, it hit a point because it needs to be a dedicated fund um, for fashion because it, fashion is quite specific. Um, and I do understand that we need to do the research in order for a fund like that to happen. That research means that, even if it means creating a white paper, cre look, doing something that makes it clear what this is in fashion. Because I think people are not quite clear the different ways in which they can sort of fund fashion. So I think that the first most important thing for people like me being in my position yes. is to create something of, a, of a, a working document for anyone that's interested to show them the, the, the different ways in which people can can benefit from, from funding fashion. That's completely amazing, Rene. And I think that, you know, that's just the one thing that we really need, some sort of blueprint yes. for people to actually know how this works. Yes. I mean, there are so many countries that, you know, just benefit from their garment industry, their fashion. And if we take, for example, Bangladesh, that's their single source of growth, yes. textile, the textile industry. So I think that it's very encouraging to hear that you're, you know, setting up to go this route to try to find a way to have that sort of inclusion in your, um, in your plan. Yeah, I think it's super, super important. And it has become essential because I hear about fashion all the time and I'm like, the scope is huge. Um, possibilities are really wide. So why don't we have a document? 
why don't we why don't we do that um because you find that in in like you know in the movie industry people have people have you know they've gone as far as they got something out of the cbn you know the you know the you know the banking committee has convinced the cbn to to, to put some certain things in place but fashion was li literally sidelined because there wasn't personnel to push push the the narrative for fashion well, I think so. right now uh, the CBN governor is making some good strides in um, the textile industry and I'm hoping that that would really influence a lot of different things um, in the coming future for the Nigerian industry. I hope so too. Yeah. I hope so. Which brings me to my next question, the Nigerian fashion industry. What do you make of our growth at this point and how do you think that we can actually change our narrative or change what we're doing wrong at this point if we are? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that Nigeria today is the biggest fashion industry in Africa, in the sense that we are the most creative um, and uh, we have really pushed the boundaries. However, we are young in fashion. So that means that there's some steps that we have taken that have left a few things behind. So even though visually we're most creative, even though in terms of organizing events around fashion, we're most successful, I think there's that the back of house that we haven't built. And therefore, I question the sustainability of this model. For me, there's a lot that we can do back of house, which is what are we doing about production? What are we doing about schools? How are people prepared for the growth that will eventually happen with the fashion industry? You know, are they equipped? What do they need? You know, so the baby steps that we really should have taken we haven't taken them because we have literally just leapt from, what am I doing today? I could be a fashion designer, to, okay, what am I going to do now? But I think that that was too fast. And that because of that, people don't understand that we're literally very young in what we could be. But it's, it's, it's good in today's world of social media and, and um, visibility, it's great that we're there right in front of it. We just have to track back a little that so that for the up and coming designers, they're able to have a, more, a smoother development into greatness. And so I think in, 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 in speaking to people who want to, who are interested in fashion, I talk to them a lot about this and say, look, there's a lot that we need to equip these kids with that can make them great. But we have the platform now. Um, we have the reputation um, and people are looking at us. So I think it's, it's good, it's a plus, but we just have to go track back and see what we can do to strengthen ourselves so that we can then project into the future. Yeah, and um, I was going to say, so you were a fashion designer before, and then you, you, you transition into this, you know. I, I transitioned into so many things. So what happened at that point when you, um, it's very interesting. It was literally just like a moment. I was actually practicing as a lawyer. I, I love clothes and I, and I love things of beauty. And I just realized I, I couldn't find things I liked <laughs> or loved. And I'm like, I can do this. <laughs> I can do this. Um, you know, and yes, I, I had a very interesting opportunity, which is when I tell people this story, they're like, really? I had an interesting opportunity. I started um, um, a studio based on somebody needing things that I had met um, in, in London who had said, oh, I, want, I don't want to go and produce in China. I said, we have so many people in, in Nigeria that can produce this for you. And I set up the studio based on that. And I did this with him for four years. And I thought, I can do this. Come on. I can, I can, I can, I can do this. And I just did it. And would you consider designing again? Uh, it's tough. It's tough. I, I don't know. I think I, I could be great at supporting designers. Okay. Fair I enough. I think there's so many young people that can benefit from my experience and my eye. So I think that it might be, and I, and I find that, I think it might be interesting to support designers as opposed to become a designer myself. Okay. So in the store right now, at Alara, how many Nigerian designers do you have? Nigerian and how designers. are they doing? Um, you know, relative with the um, foreign designers that you have in the store? It's a mix. I wish I had sort of tried to find the numbers. Um, first of all, I think we have about 11 Nigerian designers. First of all, it's important to understand that when you have foreign designers of the level that we have, everybody that stocks in Alara needs to be able to sit side by side with them so that you don't have a, 
diminishing of their brand and what they have built. It's all over the world. Any young designer you're going to have in the space with the more established designers need to be aesthetically really strong. Um, and so that is how we decide which designers we stock. Okay. We look at them and we say, okay, is it possible for you to... If, if you come to me as a Nigerian designer and I look at what you have, there's some things we look for. We look for an African element because it's important for us today. So for example, an Ashoke type thing or what? Not at all. So it doesn't me. have to be a Ashoke type thing. It doesn't even have to be direct. A contemporary interpretation of our history and heritage is, in, is, in, is enough. Okay. Um, so um, it doesn't have to be that direct. So we look for an aesthetic or something that makes you stand out, that has a story. Stories are very important to us. So what are you saying with your, with, with your collection? And how does it impact us? Um, and um, of course, the, the quality, the finishing, all that is also very important. But a lot of those you can help with. Yeah. You know, you can help say, okay, this is what you need to go and do. This is what you, your label is not working. Your stitching is not working. Go back and try it. And that, that's, that's what we do back of house. So before a designer actually emerges on our floor, if it's a young designer, they've been through a lot of mentoring and talking and adjusting before they're on the floor. The established designers, of course, are easier because they already, the people like Tiffany Amber already have established themselves and, of course, automatically they, they come in straight into our store. So in comparison to the, um, we have less Nigerian designers than we have the rest of the world um, in the sense that we are an African concept. So we do have African designers. We're also um, a global luxury store. So we do want to stock the best brands in the world. So it is, it is something that's all encompassing. Um, and I always want people to understand that we're not a Nigerian store, we're an African store. And I think as Africans, we are stronger. Um, I think that um, we have more variety. And I think I want to encourage a lot more collaborations and connections so that we can grow this idea of Africa together. Um, and I think it makes us stronger on the world stage. So you've just mentioned that you have um, 11 designers and you mentioned Tiffany Amber. Who are the other designers that you have? I know that you may have uh, Kenneth Easy, who I really, really love. Yeah, who we all love. <laughs> <laughs> I think that Kenneth really is the poster boy for African fashion today. Apart from the fact that he's super talented, he's also very well trained. He's a very clever artist and he he understands the importance of creating an African aesthetic from the roots of Africa. That's why I call him the poster boy. Because what Kenneth is doing is that he's using his talent and his training and he's bringing it back here and not waiting to be influenced by anything else and taking what we have traditionally and making it into contemporary pieces that people want to buy. Now that is a huge story. Designers who have stories own the world. Because when you think about what he's doing, he will take, literally, he comes with zero. He just comes with his brain, his talent, and his expertise. And he looks at what we have and says, I want to use something from here. And they start with thread, and they weave it, and they make it, and he refines it. And he uses his eye to choose the colors. And he designs his objects. And then he creates these amazing pieces that people covet. I don't think you would, there's anything more that you want from any designer than that commitment to sustaining our heritage and our culture. And also, with that, creating beautiful objects that people covet across boundaries. Yeah, I mean I, I, I mean, I think so too. I think he's so brilliant. And this brings me to my next question. How important is it for African designers to create looks like that so that they can have that kind of global connectivity as well? And is it, is it so important that we make pieces that can transcend um, that type of um, language for I do designs? believe it's essential. I think... We live in a global world. And do you think that we should be focusing on that in Nigeria? Not necessarily. I don't think it needs to be a focus. I don't think it's a focus for Kenneth. I think it just happens that it's an aesthetic that will transfer. 
because also of the story behind it. Apart from the fact that it's beautiful, it's a beautiful story that comes with it. Um, I, I think it's essential for us to be able to exist globally because of social media and the world today. Everybody wants something that appeals to everyone. But the most important thing that appeals to people are stories. This idea of, of stories and, 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 and now this idea of sustainability and, and what are you doing uh, in your own region um, to, to, to keep things going traditionally. Um, but I also, I, I believe that people should think about it. I don't think it's, an absolute, it's absolutely essential. But I think for us in Alara, it's super important that what you're doing is benefiting someone. So we have two ways of looking at it. So you're creating an object of beauty, which is going to benefit the user who can afford to buy it. But for us, you need to be benefiting other people as well. Who is the maker? And how are you impacting the maker? How are you impacting what's happening around the maker? And then how are you preserving our heritage and our culture? And how are you preserving it in a way that in the future, uh, other people can take from it and also use it? So for me, um, yes, it's important to have a global language because you want to sell. Right. Um, and the more people you have to sell to, the better. But more importantly is that who is benefiting from what you're doing? And we want to always look at that when we're trying to decide which designers to support. That's amazing. And you seem to be the voice for female entrepreneurs in Nigeria. Um, what advice could you give um, for people that want to venture into, you know, let's say you're the retail market that you are, are doing right now? There's different ways that I look at women and women in business. I look at them firstly personally as people. And then I look at them in terms of business because I think you cannot have one without the other. And I think I am very much one who believes very much in female power. And, and owning your power. And I think that um, in anything that we do today, especially in our environment, is understanding your talent and giving it power. And you can only give it power by believing in yourself. And I know that sounds very cliche, but honestly, I have created Alara, and literally, I don't know how many times people told me I didn't know what I was doing. <laughs> in fact, at times, I knew, I knew that I didn't know what I was doing. Really? Wow. Yes, a lot. A lot. You wake up and you say, okay. I mean, you doubt yourself because you, apart from the fact that you have many people, you know, there's nothing, there was nothing for me to measure this with. Right. And it wasn't, it was never going to be an indulgent project. Yeah. They always say when your dreams don't scare you, then you're not doing it. Exactly. So I woke up sometimes and like, really, did I really need to go this high or this big? <laughs> right? Right. Um, but I believe very much. I had the instinct. And I believe very much. And it wasn't going to be a passion project that I didn't want to work. For me, I wanted to create employment. I wanted to empower people. I wanted people to understand the importance of being African and owning that power and also being in a position to show that we too can be excellent. So that's what drove me, this kind of obsession that wh how dare anybody think we can't be excellent? You understand? And so that drove me. And, and then in terms of I think understanding the market and being able to do the numbers. I see a lot of people dabble in business. They dabble. We can't afford to do that anymore, especially as women. We need to make sure that what we're doing makes sense with the numbers. And if it doesn't, then we can't do it. Stop. You either stop or you change it. You adapt it. Look, here we do everything. Literally, we rent out the space. We sell shoes. We sell bags. We sell furniture. We do, we do we have advisory on art. We have art exhibitions. Literally, adapt it. Keep adapting it. Just make sure it works. Because you don't want to go into a room of really like super powerful men and like women sometimes and not know what you're talking about. Because we are looked at as doing the softer end of business. Right. Fashion is looked at as being soft. Right. So as a person, if I come in, I want to do this, fashion, and they, literally, I, I still get it. So I still get it. No matter what I say, I still get it. I still really? go in a room and people are like, uh, she's, she's just doing the, fashion. The fashion. It's just fashion. Wow. You know what I mean? And so I think it's important <laughs> for people who want to do fashion to understand that they need to create a big structure, a great structure around themselves, that people are able to look at them and say, yes, the numbers work. I want to do that. I want to be part of that. And, I, and it's not impossible. It's just like we have to work very hard and we have to keep it going. I suppose it's easy for me because I'm in it now. But honestly, it needs to, that's the most important thing, to have a, a plan and a plan that's matched with its numbers that can help you sit in a room 
of people who are going to give you money. Fantastic job, <laughs> really fantastic. Yes. So tell me, what, what next for you and what, oh my what's God, next for Lara? And do you intend to open more Laras, perhaps globally? For sure, I think we have a great um, concept that can travel. I think we need to tra make it travel. I think we need to take it to the world. I um, mean, I say a lot of times, I said, Alara is a window for the world to see the possibilities. Um, and the possibilities are huge. The variety is huge. And I, and I like us to speak an African language because I think with an African language, we can change so quickly and we can have something amazing all the time. And I always say that if I change Alara like 100 times, it would not be the same twice. And we change a lot. We keep going. We change things all the time. But you know why it won't change? Why, why, why it will still thrill people? Because there's so much this continent has to offer that nobody has even explored. And just to be in the position where I can do it is a blessing. You've done so a fantastic you. job, Renee. Thank and I you. must congratulate you. Thank you. I'd like to say thank you so much for honoring my invitation. Oh, with pleasure. I have waited to do this for so long. I know we've been planning it for yes, a long we've been time. I just thought this would be the right time. Yes. Well, congratulations to you also, uh, Uji, on that uh, excellent yeah, interview. Yeah, that was thank brilliant. You. Great yeah. job, Uji. Thank you, thank you. But you see, uh, she raised quite a number of points yes. that I think we can just, first I, you know, admire for, uh, you know, spirit of uh, enterprise, also a drive for excellence, a creativity. Uh, but she, there's this point she made about skill set for younger women, you know, who want to go into business or any woman at all. And I think that is very important. When she said people just dabble in business, they think it's just for you to open a shop, you know, but you must, according to her, know how to do the numbers. And I think that that's a very uh, strong uh, message. She also made a lot of points about innovation, yes. uh, which, which is, is also, also very interesting. And then a point yeah. about, you know, a method of convergence. You see, it's not just one item. You have fashion, you have uh, luxury, you have cuisine, you have architecture, you have space and design, and you, know, you know, you have events, all of that put together, you know, feeding off each other. And when I was listening to her, you know, I remember the, uh, a lady we interviewed, I think on Monday, Lola Emerua, okay. uh, who is putting together a program in June, first week of June, you know, and she was, you know, our own uh, program is also about this mix of luxury, luxury fashion, fashion cuisine, yeah. architecture, technology, and all of that. And I think it's a very good development that we see entrepreneurs, you know, like this who are working in that direction. The other point that I take away from it is a point about funding, yes. which was a major point at the Arise Fashion Week. And she was on the panel about, you know, how to raise capital and all that. But, you know, uh, there were two arguments that day, that one, funding is important, but it's not the all important thing. Uh, second, you know, women in fashion and design must know how to access funds. I don't think she gave enough credit to government. I think that uh, the Nigerian government in recent times has been doing a lot in that direction. The Bank of Industry, the funding for the creative industry. She says it must be fashion specific. Yes, and but I, my and understanding, I, I'll explain to Yeah, you but my ex understanding is that fashion is covered in that uh, envelope. And then the Central Bank of Nigeria, she referred to the CBN too. The CBN, in fact, has a special policy for the textile and garment industry. Correct. Okay? Um, and MFLA has been talking a lot about yes. this. The thing to do is perhaps, those of you who are in the fashion uh, and design industry, maybe you need to interface more with the appropriate government departments and the CBN to see how it's not just textile and garment, how the entire value chain can be supported all through, you know, uh, by the uh, government. And that is why her point about creating some sort of blueprint okay. to present to the government facilities or to any investor that'd like to invest in fashion is so important because like she, she rightly said, fashion is looked at as such a, you know, not an industry that people would want to invest in. Um, people in the banking industry are very flaky about the fashion industry. And I think that it's so important that she can set that precedence to create that type of document, a working document, that people would see fashion and really want to invest in fashion and see that it's a viable business Absolutely. in Nigeria. Which is why she also well. mentioned fashion schools as well and the fact yes. that we can't just think we can just hop right into it. There's actually a process to this. This is a whole industry and that is so important. We don't have fashion schools in Nigeria on a global standard yeah. that can keep people in jobs like right. Alara without any there training them, you know? Right. So it's so important and venture capitalists as well. But at a higher level, I think you know, I also uh, I'm impressed that 
you know, this is not just about business. There is also an ideological, philosophical uh, foundation oh, to it. that much is clear. Lola Emerua, you know, and herself, they're talking about promoting African design, promoting Africanity, promoting the African narrative. Whole African uh, land and I think that that's really, really uh, something to encourage. Absolutely. Great job, OJ. Thank you, Tindu.